Welcome to Pocus Geek. I'm Jared Marks. And recently I became aware of this trauma case that I thought would be good for teaching. Uh, this was a motor vehicle collision and the patient was hypotensive, a young adult uh, male that was involved in that accident, and an EFAST was performed. And I think there was a lot of good teaching points here that can help us um, reiterate good basic habits of identifying free fluid. And then there's a couple subtle findings that didn't, can indicate to us uh, more what's going on too. Um, so I'd like to go through this case with you. I want you to approach this as you look at the images uh, addressing these binary questions. And when it comes to is there free fluid, we're gonna think of that in the intraperitoneal cavity or abdominal cavity, in the thoracic cavity, and also in the pericardial sac. So I'm gonna give you a chance to look through these images and formulate for yourself uh, the answers to these three questions and see if you can identify all the pathology. Again, some of them are very straightforward, some of them are subtle, um, but I do want to give you the chance to do that. And then at the end, I'll review that, um, review all of the images um, for it. And again, I did not edit any of these images, I just took them as they were, because as we know, uh, clinically when we work this, we don't get the ideal textbook image, and these were just obtained, and I transfer these to the video um, as, are, as they are, and without any editing. So. Go through these, see if you can find all the findings, and again, you'll get about four seconds for the images and about eight seconds for videos. So, as you went through those, were you able to identify the different findings? Um, and we're gonna go through each one of these and, and answer these questions. Um, but I will go through the images next too and point out some uh, key findings for them. Just uh, point out some good teaching points and things that I think will generally be helpful for people as they perform EFAST exams. So, is there free fluid? Um, yes, we have free fluid in the right upper quadrant and in the pelvis and there's clot forming. Um, that we can see. It's a little hard to say for the thorax and for the uh, pericardial views, um, given that a peristernal long axis was a, tried to be obtained with a convex probe. Uh, was there cardiac function normal? Again, um, that was a limitation of doing it with the probe they did, um, but it was indeterminate. Was there lung sliding present? Yes. And anything else? Yeah. So this is an interesting case in that there's actually a splenic injury and you can identify it and we'll go through and, and review that here as we go through the images. So there was a lot of multiple images, which is okay. Um, and there were some videos. I'm just gonna focus on the things that I think are uh, most helpful for teaching. And what I wanted to point out in here is, I want you to look at how little of blood or, I mean, it's even hard to say if that's positive through this area. As we look right there, there's that little stripe, but that could just be like a little artifact. But the key is look how we collect fluid at the inferior tip of the liver. and. The inferior tip of the liver is our pericolic gutter, and that is the key to identifying fluid in the right upper quadrant. And so this is critical that we always visualize this. Now, when we look at the thorax, uh, remember we do want to see above the diaphragm. In this case, however, we don't, so we could not determine if there's free thoracic fluid. Um, we don't see any fluid back here between the kidney and the psoas muscle. So it doesn't look like there's a retroperitoneal bleed, but we definitely have intraperitoneal fluid here. Um, that is uh, noted. Now, the interesting thing about this, and most um, of the time this injury occurs, is that this was a splenic injury, 
and there is no fluid in the leftover quadrant. Now it is a little limited because we would want to see it go along this diaphragm and we have this large area of black in this area that's just not good contact. Maybe there's a rib that's part of that, but there's not free fluid in the left upper quadrant, even though this is a splenic injury that has to do with this uh, splenic colic ligament and that it just doesn't have space there. Um, but I, what I do want you to see, and I'm gonna try to circle this as best as I can or drop through it, but right through here, we have this area through the spleen that is a little bit darker and a little bit different than the rest of the echo texture. And that is your splenic laceration that's occurred. Now don't get that confused with the hilum. Um, it, can also, it can be hyperechoic, it can be hypoechoic like it is here. But what we wanna do is identify when we look at the spleen, which is through here, is we wanna look, is that echo texture the same throughout? And we can see that this area right here and right here does not look the same as this. And so this is actually the injury that occurred for the patient and was causing the massive bleeding that they have. And so we're gonna go on here. And when I say that this was a large bleed, we look at the pelvis and what we start to see is rouleau formation that we see this in vessels sometimes within a low flow state. But in the pelvis here, we actually see, let me go back a image. What we actually see here in the pelvis is that um, we can start to see the this echogenic area. And this is the blood essentially becoming so static that it's starting to clot. Um, and that's in the pelvis while all of this through here is blood. And what I wanna point out again is just like in the drawing over here is we do have bladder over here. I'm gonna shade that in with yellow. So this is bladder and this is our blood right here all through this. And we can see that bowel floating in there. And what's key is that we look at this wall right here right through there. And that is the separation of the peritoneal cavity. What I want you to pay attention to is that there is no fluid directly posterior. So if this is anterior at the top of the screen and posterior is, is at the bottom of the screen, there is no fluid down in this area here. And it's not directly behind the bladder that we see fluid because that would be looking into the pelvis. But when we look to identify fluid in the intraperitoneal cavity, as we see over here on the diagram, on the right, it's actually gonna be on the superior side or to the left of the screen uh, of our bladder. And that's exactly what we're seeing here is that all through this area up here is to the superior portion or cephalad on our patient. And that's where we're seeing that fluid build up. I do like the video, I think it's okay. Um, There's multiple images taken. Obviously it was kind of a cool finding that they had and they could see that it was a large amount of hemoperitoneum. Um, and we do see this really low formation in this low flow state of blood collecting and becoming um, clot, um, but you know probably not necessary given the other. Now, if we come back to the short access and we think about the pelvis, remember when we look in a short access, I probably would not have included this view um, because we already have identified the large fluid in the in the intraperitoneal cavity down at the pelvic view. But when we look at this. Um, we are looking straight through the bladder, which is all of this, and we're just looking at the prostate. And that actually means that we're looking, uh, this being the prostate right here, that we're looking into the pelvis and we're actually not identifying the anteroperitoneal cavity. So just remember, if you're only looking in a per pelvic short axis, you are not going to be seeing that fluid in the anteroperitoneal cavity. And, and I would recommend against doing that because you want to definitely see it. There's nothing too exciting about the lung views. What I do like though is that because this is not undifferentiated shortness of breath at this time that the depth was really uh, shallow and that they were able to visualize the lung sliding. This is representative of all the images taken on the anterior chest and I really like this. I like that they really focused on that pleural line and were able to tell that there was uh, lung sliding visible there. Again, um, they were moving quickly through this. We do see some cardiac motion, so we know they have cardiac motion. We probably have some vital signs of some sort. Uh, it's hard to see if there's a fluid around the heart, unlikely to be large given this view, but a lot of limitations to this, and we're not gonna be able to tell their function. If you're getting something like this and you really need to know that, um, that's gonna depend on you when you're taking care of the patient, then you should switch to a phased array or a cardiac probe, but in this case, it was probably okay. I mean, they knew what they were dealing with. Um, they were dealing with an intraperitoneal bleed uh, and um, we can see that splenic injury here. Again, um, 
we can probably move forward. What I do want to say wrapping up here is that the intraperitoneal bleed um, is what we need to identify. The fact that there's a splenic injury, I don't, it doesn't matter if we recognize that, it just matters that we identify the bleed. Um, but it is interesting in this case that we were actually able to see that splenic injury. Again, I hope you find that helpful. If you do, uh, do uh, please make sure to subscribe, hit that notification bell so that you can get these other educational tidbits as you learn and implement POCUS into your clinical care. Again, I'm Jared Marks with POCUS Geek, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me in the comments below or at POCUSGeek at gmail.com. Take care.